Hi, everyone, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's neuroscience research podcast. Today is April 25th. It's a Monday, so it is not our usual Thursday podcast. Today, we have a special opportunity to chat with Eric Olson, who is in town to give our annual neuroscience and brain health distinguished published lecture. Eric is professor and chair of molecular biology at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He also directs the Hammond Center for Regenerative Science and Medicine and the Wellstone Center for Muscular Dystrophy Research. He holds the Annie and Willie Nelson Professorship in Stem Cell Research and the Robert A. Uh, Welch Distinguished Chair in Sciences. Eric studies transcription factors and other cellular mechanisms that control development, growth, and diseases in the heart and other muscles, and his recent work has provided a new strategy for correction of Duchenne muscular dystrophy using CRISPR gene editing, and I think that's probably what we'll talk about today. Hi, Eric, and thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Also with us, Jenny Shea, Sims Foundation Distinguished Chair in Cell Biology and Professor and Chair of our department here at UTSA and Director of the UTSA Brain Health Consortium. Jenny was once a member of Eric's department at Southwestern. So hi, Jenny. Hi, happy to be here. And me, I'm your host, Charlie Wilson. So Eric, when we say gene editing, it evokes an image of somebody getting in there and correcting a genetic sequence, replacing it with specifically with something, or writing a new sequence in place. And CRISPR-Cas9 is a method for cutting both strands of DNA at some very specific sites. And the cut DNA is repaired by the cell, but the result is not the same sequence, of course, that was there before the edit, but it's not really editing in the sense it's used, say, in video editing or text editing. So uh, help us to understand how you use a method like this to repair a specific genetic mutation, like the ones that cause Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Sure, yeah, happy to talk about that. So. CRISPR is a revolutionary uh, gene editing tool that was originally derived from a primitive immune system in bacteria that enabled bacteria uh, to recognize invading viruses and to chop up their DNA sequences. And it's now been possible to uh, exploit that biological system to modify the genome of any organism, uh, including the genomes of humans. It's built on a two-component system. One component involves what's called a guide RNA. This can be programmed with any sequence of any target uh, se sequence of nucleotides in the genome. And that guide RNA, when introduced into a cell, will recognize, it will find its target sequence in that genome. The second component is an enzyme an endonuclease, most commonly uh, called Cas9, although there are a large number of these enzymes that are being identified every day. You can think about the, the uh, enzyme as molecular scissors, and you can think about the guide RNA as a molecular GPS device. So the GPS device is programmed to find its target, and that brings along the molecular scissors, and when the two come together on the target sequence, the scissors will will cut the double-stranded DNA. And then the DNA repair machinery can fix that. Now, in the first iteration of CRISPR that we deployed, we used it to do what's referred to as exon skipping. That is, if there's a particular segment of the gene that codes for a protein, and if it harbors a mutation, we could use these molecular scissors to snip out a portion of that exon, and then it would be skipped and the, the gene would go on to the next one, and it could create uh, a corrected protein lacking just that one mutated area. Now, to come to your question about, is that actually editing the genome? And that, that initial version is more, we, would, we call it single-cut CRISPR, because you're making a cut with the molecular scissors. But in recent years, there's been several adaptations to that technology, one of which is called base editing. So if you think about uh, version 1.0 of CRISPR as molecular scissors that cut the double-stranded DNA, you could think about base editing as a fine point pen, pen where you can find any nucleotide in the DNA sequence and with the appropriate guide RNA and the base editor, the base editor is a version of Cas9 enzyme that's been modified so it can 
change nucleotides, sequences, letters in the DNA at the target. So you can you could literally change one single letter in the DNA sequence and correct it back to the, the normal sequence. Now that is an especially powerful method for gene editing because it's precise and because it does not involve the cutting of the double-stranded DNA helix. Cutting, you can imagine that cutting of the double-stranded DNA helix could in itself have some inherent risks uh, associated with it, whereas base editing does not require that. Now, even more recently, David Liu's lab at the Broad Institute has uh, adapted a, a new form of gene editing called prime editing. Now, prime editing makes it possible to insert remove or change any target sequence in the genome. And so this is, as you can imagine, a, an incredibly powerful and precise method for modifying DNA sequences and removing uh, mutations. Again, it does not require uh, cut, cutting of the double-stranded DNA. So if you think about version 1.0 as molecular scissors, and if you think about base editing as a fine-point pen, you could think about prime editing as a word processor, where you can literally program into the genome any sequence that you want to uh, introduce. And so you can imagine the power of these approaches uh, to uh, modify or remove uh, mutations that cause severe human disease, but not only in humans. CRISPR is being used to modify the genetics of, of plants, of bacteria, of viruses, of virtually any animal uh, and organism uh, on the planet, uh, you can modify its genome with this approach. So, in the sing but you put the single cut method to, to good use. And in that case, I think that a clever choice of exactly where to cut is the key to that thing, to get that exon to not be, uh, to be taken out of the mix. Yes. So, for that, you have to understand what's determining what exon gets used and what exon doesn't get read, and then go in and cut in just the right spot. Uh, is that a strategy that has general application? Is that because that seems to me the simplest, most readily implemented version of it right now? The nature of the uh, edit that is introduced by the single cut CRISPR with the molecular scissors varies depending on the target sequence and depending on the sequence of the guide RNA that's used to deliver the endonuclease to the target site. And we're not yet at a stage where we can uh, predict with certainty exactly what the edit will be. So in our case, we're trying to correct mutations uh, responsible for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a disease of muscle that we'll, prob we'll probably talk to talk about. But in our initial uh, test cases, we looked at a variety of different guide RNAs that would make allow uh, the enzyme to cut at different places, and we s selected which of those guide RNAs would uh, enable the type of edit that we wanted. And remarkably, we identified guide RNAs, which when uh, combined with the endonuclease to make the double-stranded break, would result in repair of the double-stranded sequence by insertion of one single nucleotide at the cut site. And fortuitously, when one introduces one single nucleotide in the, the gene with certain types of mutations, that could completely restore the expression of the normal gene with absolute precision and absolute safety as far as we've been able to tell so far. So maybe it is good to talk about the mutations that give rise to muscular dystrophy and how the strategy is, has to be based on the individual mutations that occur. So my lab has worked on uh, the biology, uh, the development, and the disease of muscle tissues, both skeletal muscle and heart, for my entire career. The most devastating genetic disorder of muscle, which has defied every therapy, is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, abbreviated DMD. This disease was first described uh, in uh, 1876 by the French neurologist Dr. Guillain Duchenne. 
And since that time, uh, it has defied every possible therapy. The g disease is caused by mutations in the largest gene in the human genome. This is a gene encoding for a protein called dystrophin. And dystrophin functions as a molecular shock absorber for all the membranes of the skeletal muscle and the heart uh, in the body. And it maintains the integrity of those muscle membranes during contraction and relaxation. In the absence of dystrophin, muscle membranes become fragile and tear. Thousands of mutations have been identified in boys around the world with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and uh, not a day goes by that I don't receive an email from a mother somewhere on the planet telling me about uh, their son and, and his uh, mutation. So these uh, mutations cluster into what are known as hot spots, short regions of the gene where large numbers of mutations are clustered, presumably because the DNA sequence is unstable in that region. Now, one of the challenges with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that the dystrophin gene, which is responsible for this disease, is the largest gene in the human genome. It spans 2.5 million letters of DNA. So this is a massive gene. And because of its large size, dystrophin cannot, or muscular dystrophy cannot be corrected by gene replacement or gene therapy, as might be uh, typically done in other types of disorders, because the gene is simply too big. And so that's why we thought about how we might use CRISPR to uh, correct the gene in its normal endogenous location within the, in the chromosome. And using single-cut CRISPR, then we were able to skip, correct um, many of the most common exons, exon deletions. And we believe that this approach can be adapted to correct roughly 80% uh, of the mutations that have been described in boys worldwide with, with Duchenne. So you'd have to identify the mutation in a particular patient and sort of design a therapy for that particular mutation. Yes, you, you absolutely must know the mutation that you're trying to correct. And based on that knowledge, then you can decide which guide RNA would be the most appropriate and which of the three approaches, either single cut CRISPR, base editing, or prime editing, would be the, the most effective uh, therapeutic approach. So in the, ex uh, in the experiments you were d first talking about, was you tried some different things to find out what works. In the patient, that kind of trial and error is sort of not part of the plan. So I think, so, um, so there's becomes, has to become a sort of algorithm for saying, well, for this mutation, we need to do it this way. And for this one, it, could the single cut work for lots of the addition ones? It can work for uh, a majority uh, of uh, patients. Now, the dystrophin gene, as I've said, is, is massive. And nature did not modify that gene over evolution. The gene has the same, uh, roughly the same sequence. It has the same uh, organization of exons across species. So you can devise a strategy to correct a mutation in a mouse, and you can extrapolate as to how that would work in a human. And to further uh, substantiate uh, our approach, we were graciously provided with blood samples from a number of boys who have uh, the disease, and we were able to convert those blood samples into induced pluripotent stem cells, so-called IPS cells, which can then be converted into muscle. So then we could test the different guide RNAs and the different strategies in the actual genome of the patient with the mutation that we're trying to correct. So you can do trial and error yes, on you that can. patient. And you can, you can faithfully predict how this therapy would work in a boy based on how it worked in that boy's cells in a dish. So, um, does uh, do you think this type of correction for dystrophin could work in patients that already have symptoms? This is a very a very good question. Uh, it's one we've thought about a lot. This type of therapy it is, assuming it makes it all the way to a therapy, it will be most effective when introduced as early as possible in the patient. Ideally, if I look into my crystal ball and uh, think about what I would hope would occur, 
if a, a boy is uh, born with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, he could be diagnosed at birth. If we then know the mutation, we could intervene at that time by delivery of the gene editing components for that mutation. And to deliver those, we use uh, adeno-associated virus, AAV, which is a harmless virus. It's been approved for use by the FDA in gene therapy trials. And we know from our work in mice and in dogs with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy that if you intervene early, before the muscle has been destroyed, that you can stop the progression of the disease from that point forward. And part of the reason that you can stop this disease in its tracks is because skeletal muscle and the heart are permanent tissues that do not turn over uh, in our bodies. The nuclei and the DNA within them that you were born with are the ones that you live with for your whole life. And so if we can correct the mutation early, we believe that will last forever. The other reason to intervene early is because this is a progressive disorder where muscle tissues are, are disintegrating uh, quite rapidly. And once the muscle tissue is gone, there's nothing left that we can, can repair. So we really would like to do this as early as possible. So when you deliver it, it's systemic? You're giving it to every tissue? Or are you trying to apply it directly to the developing muscle tissue? Yeah, so it's a, this is a good question. Uh, there are two ways that CRISPR gene editing is being deployed right now uh, for uh, disease correction. One is called ex vivo gene editing. That's where you take cells out of a patient, for example, hematopoietic stem cells, take them out of the patient, edit them. This is being done for sickle cell disease, for example. And then you put the edited cells back into the patient, and then they repopulate the patient. The other form of gene editing is called in vivo gene editing. We are restricted right now to using in vivo gene editing just because skeletal muscle represents 40% of the human body mass. And we can't edit enough stem cells to put back and reconstitute the entire structure uh, of the musculature. So we're using uh, adeno-associated virus, and there's a particular serotype that we're using. It's called AAV9. And this has a preferential, it's not exclusive, but a preferential tropism for muscle tissue and the heart. So we inject the gene editing components encoded within AAV9 systemically through a single intravenous injection uh, into animals, not mice and dogs so far, and it will go find its target tissue and deliver the contents to that tissue, and then uh, they will find their target in the genome and edit it. We've also built in uh, an additional safety feature into the virus, and that is we've put DNA sequences into the virus that are active only in muscle and the heart. So they drive very high expression of the gene editing components in those muscle tissues, but they're, they're completely silent in other tissues. So if the virus goes elsewhere, and this virus does go to the liver, it uh, does not lead to any expression of the gene editing components at that site. That's how many viruses does it take per muscle cell to make it work? Is, it, is there enough payload in one virus to do it? The amount of virus that's needed represents the single biggest challenge to the therapeutic translation of this technology. And that is because in order to saturate all the muscle tissues and the heart, it requires 1 times 10 to the 14 viral genomes per kilogram of body weight. You think about <laughs> 1 times 10 to the 14. That's a big, big number. And so the, the challenge, and this is a challenge that's, uh, that we're confronting, but everyone in the gene therapy space is confronting the same challenge for whatever disease they're trying to correct. You, you need to be able to manufacture high-quality virus free of contaminants, and you need to be able to deliver it safely uh, to the patient and not exceed the uh, upper threshold of toxicity, which is somewhere close to the to the therapeutic uh, necessary therapeutic dose. So that that really, as you may know, is really the number one challenge in the whole gene therapy space right now. 
and the vir the two pieces have to be in separate viruses, right? Because the Cas9 is pretty big and it's going to take up a whole virus by itself. Is that not true? So you're giving two viruses. Right? Yeah. Um, so in our first version of uh, gene editing, um, we used two different viruses, exactly as you said. One virus encodes the enzyme Cas9, the other virus encodes the guide RNA. We had to inject both together. They go into the cell and find their way to the target. In subsequent uh, iterations of, of this technology, we've built what we call all-in-one vectors, where we've been able to reduce the size of, of the Cas9 enzyme and compartmentalize everything into a single vector. That simplifies the process a lot and lowers the, uh, reduces a lot of the manufacturing challenges. So that's a designer Cas9. It's been stripped of its unnecessary components or something? Uh, it's, uh, yes, it's, there are designer Cas9s such as the one I'm describing, but there, there are myriad versions of Cas9 in nature. And scientists, not ourselves, but uh, many scientists are systematically screening through all of these Cas9 enzymes to characterize them with respect to the target sequences they recognize, their sizes, etc. And so you can, it's almost like going to a catalog and looking up which uh, type of Cas9 you'd like to use based on its size, based on its target sequence, based on other uh, characteristics. And I think that's really where, where we're headed with uh, gene, um, gene editing technologies in the future. So it's largely in the design of the Cas9 as well as the guide. On it. The guide uh, is a is sort of a simple idea, and it contains some number of bases, and you have to match to them, and you have to match to them completely. Is that right? You have to match with absolute precision for targeting to the okay. gene of interest, but there is. Uh, some wobble occasionally. You can get the uh, the guide might recognize, say there's a sequence elsewhere in the mm -hmm. genome that's differing by one letter from your target sequence. That's what's referred to as off-target editing. That is, that is the biggest uh, safety concern that's been raised by the FDA for in vivo gene editing. And that is that the FDA wants to be as certain as possible that whatever guide RNA is selected for a therapeutic indication does not have off-target editing activity such that you might inadvertently edit a gene that's necessary or that's beneficial. We do not think, and so far we have no evidence to indicate that off-target editing will be a significant issue for uh, diseases of muscle like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we've looked a lot for off-target editing, and we simply have not seen it. And I think that's in part because uh, muscle tissue uh, and muscle nuclei do not divide. They're permanently out of the cell cycle. And so one doesn't have cancers of muscle and heart that you might worry about occurring in response to an off-target uh, edit. And also, uh, many of the off-target uh, effects that have been uh, reported in the literature have been observed in uh, cultured cells in a dish that are highly proliferative and where they're exposed to exceedingly high levels of gene editing components. In an animal situation, we can't achieve that level of expression of the editing components. So they're orders of magnitude lower in their expression. So we really don't think that that will be uh, a challenge going forward. So it's it's kind of like a password, really, and the longer it is, the less likely it is to be identified somewhere yeah, else. That's right? a good. So is it an adjustable thing? If you could decide that twenty wasn't enough to get specificity, you could go to thirty, yeah. like we do with passwords. You, you can could. make uh, slightly longer versions. Uh, yeah, and so you you really need to use um, bioinformatics sequence analysis tools to select the optimum guide RNA. And there are some other uh, variations uh, in the DNA sequence that play into the efficiency uh, of, of editing. So the chances of getting the same sequence of 20 bases in a row by 
chants are extremely low, right there, four they're, to the 20. They're extremely low, and because the, the genomes, you know, the human genome uh, has been sequenced, of course, what one does is when you select a guide RNA for a specific target sequence, you scan the entire human genome sequence for anything related to that, and you'll end up with a list of potential off targets that are mismatched by one or by two or by three. And so you can, using that approach, then you can uh, focus your off target analysis just on those sequences without having to sequence, uh, plow through three billion letters of, of nucleotide sequence in every uh, cell. So can I ask you, um, so let's say you're successful, the strategy. Now the boys have a chance to live a, a, no, a relatively normal and healthy life and, and, and have um, into their reproductive years. W what options do they have in terms of, you know, for protecting their future generation? Because te technically this will not affect their germ cells and their children would still have the mutation. It will... Uh... You're correct. It will the approach we're taking will not affect the uh, germ cells. That's referred to as germline editing, as, as I think all of you know. And we, I, I want to make it clear, we are not attempting to do germline editing right. right now. Although we do germline editing in mice all the time, and so it, there's no question that it it can work, but. The, we just don't have enough uh, guidelines yet, and that's going to require a lot of discussions, uh, not only with scientists, but regulatory people and uh, lay people uh, and, and uh, other officials uh, to decide, you know, for what diseases and when would germline editing be an appropriate therapy. Do I believe germline editing will occur? At some point, yes, I do believe germline editing will occur for diseases for which there are no other options. So, for example, for Huntington's disease would be an example. That I think that that will occur, uh, but as of now, uh, it's we're not ready to do that. What about genetic diseases that affect the brain? Is there a way to deliver? This same cocktail of things in the brain that help with genetic forms of Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or something. Like that. I think absolutely diseases of the brain will lend themselves to these types of approaches. Uh, there are AAVs that have good uh, tropism for the brain. You need to get past the blood-brain barrier. Uh, I think intrathecal delivery uh, is being used to. Uh, test these technologies on some brain disorders. And there may be other non-viral approaches that could be used to deliver gene editing components to the brain. So yes, I do believe the brain uh, will be uh, a target for gene editing therapies. And in some respects, it might be uh, more straightforward than what we're trying to do. The brain is this big. The muscle tissue is this big. So you've got a lot a uh, more defined target to try to edit. And certainly you can think about how one might use uh, stereotypic delivery systems into specific centers of the brain to deliver gene editing opponents in a very focal uh, region to modify genetically a subset of, of neurons. And I think that's a really exciting area. If I was working on uh, genetics of brain disease, that's probably what I'd be working on. So that's a great lesson and a good ending. So thank you very much, uh, Eric Olson and Ginny Shea. And Happy to be here. Thank you. This has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop.